Lord, we bring you our worship tonight. God, we love you.
Lord. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And our hearts will sing how great is our God. How great. You are great, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. Hi. Good evening. Can y'all hear me? I'm sorry. I couldn't hear myself for a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's open in a word of prayer. Oh, Lord, how great you are, Father. Lord, we just exalt you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We love you. And Lord, I pray and ask that your abundant blessing would be upon every person in this house tonight. Lord, I pray you be with us. Prepare our hearts and minds for your word. And Lord, let everything done here tonight bring praise to you, Father, for you alone are worthy, Lord. May I decrease and you increase, Father. I pray and ask it in your son Jesus' perfect name. Amen. Amen. Well, Good evening, ladies, and welcome to your Tuesday night Bible study here at Core Church Los Angeles. I hope your 2024 is off to a great start. It's only nine days in, so our, you know, New Year's resolutions, they probably still matter to us. Uh, <laughs> well, I like the idea of, of making an honest self-assessment and seeing where I can make some changes. Um, certain things, you know, like most people, I do okay in, but Looking back in 2023, I, I definitely had some areas where I fell short. Um, but like Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as one having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So praise the Lord that we've made it into 2024. So amen. Amen. So let's start strong and stay firm in our convictions, in our faith. Whatever happened in 2023, it happened. But let's not let what happened 300 days ago or even just a few weeks ago keep us from fulfilling our God-given purposes and plans this year. Um, as a body, we're all going in different directions and we're in different places in life. But wherever you find yourself this evening, um, the Lord does have plans for you. Um, and you may be asking, well, where do I start? What does the Lord want me to do? And what do I do right now? Um, I want to share a few verses with you that I believe can minister to everyone. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 18 says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Micah 6, chap chapter 6, verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does he require? but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 17 says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, 
not as unwise men or women, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I think just those three verses were good places to start. He wants us to be kind to one another. He wants us to rejoice. He wants us to pray without ceasing and give thanks. He wants us to be wise and not foolish. And ladies, I believe if we can commit to just doing those things, I believe the specific and unique will of God for your life will come into focus. And yes, sometimes I do wish that I could be reading in my Bible and it will say, Melanie, here is exactly what you do, and your bullet points are behind the concordance. But we know that's not how, how things work. The Lord may not lay out his 365-day plan for us, but each day he has fresh mercies for us and for fresh grace for us. And each day, if we're willing to seek him, his Holy Spirit will lead and guide us into all truth, his truth that will fill our hearts and minds. And his plans and purposes will become the longing of our hearts, and it will be what drives us. You will reach your goals and your plans, and you'll accomplish what you want to accomplish when your goals and your plans align with the heart of the Lord. So whether you're hoping for a better position or just more stability to start a family or just have better relations with the family you have now, whatever your hopes are for this year, you take it to the Lord in prayer. His word tells us to cast our cares upon him because he cares about us. And although God may not give us every single thing we ask for, especially when those things threaten our commitment and threaten our relationship with Christ, remember, he will not withhold anything from us that he deems as good. Um, I can't speak for everybody, but I, I had a rough couple of weeks there at the last of last year, but um, that was last year, and this is this year. And the Lord has seen fit to give me and you life and breath. So let us make the best use of our time now. Make an effort and not an excuse. Let's make the effort to be diligent in our Bible studies and be diligent in our private time with the Lord. Make the effort to come out every Tuesday night. Make the effort to be more like Christ this year. And this week in the study guide, we covered Isaiah chapters 24 through 27, verse 13, chapter 33, verses 1 through 12, and chapter 34, verse 1 through 17. I know. Um, and again, my message, I've probably said this before, but my message can't possibly cover every point and every principle in those, in those chapters, but my prayer has been that the word would be ministering to all of you as the word ministers to me. Um, and the title of the message is coming from the study guide. It says, King of the World. And I have four quick points. My first point is God's judgment and God's favor. My second point is lesson from the remnant. My third point is remove the high places. And my fourth point is pay attention. So hopefully you all have your Bibles, so please follow along. Um, my first point is God's judgment and God's favor. Chapter 24 opens with Isaiah making a future prophecy. In verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste and devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. In that day, the earth will be utterly changed and plundered. And I don't typically think of the earth being punished or judged as man, um, but in reading this, I'm, I'm just reminded of that. But when sin entered the world, it didn't just devastate us as humans. The land was cursed as well. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, it says that the Lord cursed the ground. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 22, it says that all of creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The earth groans to be delivered from the bondage of corruption, longing as we do to be free of sin. Verse 2 and 3 point out that no one on earth during that time will escape the judgment that the earth will go through. Um, and sometimes without being aware, we adhere to certain hierarchies. You know, people that we think are worthy of our time and of our energy and our respect, we place them up here. And people that we don't, we kind of place them down here. And there are people that, you know, are, that are just on the fringes of our lives that we are indifferent towards. But I love how the Lord levels the playing field. He doesn't see that that way. There's no more important, less important with him. No one will escape God's judgment on earth. 
not the lay person, not the priest, not the one who needs to borrow, not the borrower, not the maid, not her mistress. They will all bear witness to the desolation that will take place in those days and be judged from the exalted and revered to the discarded and despised. The Lord will utterly destroy all of his opposition. In chapter 25, Isaiah is praising the Lord for his favor for the plans established in eternity past. And I love how it, it begins. It says, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. And I remember I was reading these scriptures the night before Thanksgiving and it, it just so deeply touched my heart. I remember just being so grateful. Um, I just looked around, I said, God, you know, thank you for a, a place to live, a job to go to family and friends that care about me. I mean, just, just so many things. I was just so aware of God's favor has been all over my life. Um, I mean, but it hasn't always been great and everything hasn't always gone the way that I want it. Losing my parents has been tough. Moving from rural Alabama to Los Angeles was tough. Rejection in its various forms is, is unpleasant. But when I consider all things, I am reminded that the Lord has been holding on to me, holding on to us in every moment of heartbreak, in every moment of anger and defeat, every moment that we think we're slipping away. He has been with us. Even when we're just doing our own things and you know, we're not giving the Lord a second thought, even then he has never forgotten us and we have always been precious to him. The character of God is seen throughout this chapter, and verse 1 speaks of his faithfulness. Verse 4 tells us that he has been the defense for the helpless and defense for those who are needy and in distress. Verse 8 says he will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord will wipe tears away from all faces. And to me, this speaks of the tenderness and the compassion of God, removing the sorrow associated with death. Who here has, has been burdened by grief? the ache of loss so great that you thought it might bury you too. You're surprised that you keep on living because this grief is so terrible. The sun comes up and you gotta keep going, you gotta go to work, you have responsibilities, and somehow you endure. But ladies, even this is the favor of God. The word teaches that he is near the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. This is the hand of God on us that we are not overwhelmed, that we are not overcome by loss, we are not overcome by grief, and one day he's gonna destroy them both forever. And my second point is a lesson from the remnant. Um, in chapter 26, verse one, the strong city that Isaiah is referring to is, is future Jerusalem. After God has vanquished all of the enemies of Jerusalem, there will be a remnant. And at that time, they will live in perfect peace and perfect rest and safety. And in that day, God will bring down all of those who dwell in high places. And those high places represent um, idol worship and, and those who oppose his laws. And as I read chapter 26, I know verse 3, you know, it's a popular verse. The steadfast in mind he will keep in perfect peace because he trusts you. Um, but I couldn't stop coming back to verses 8 and 9. They say, indeed, while following the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you eagerly. Your name, even your memory, is the desire of our souls. At night, my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. For when the earth experiences your judgments, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Here, a future remnant, they're expressing how they have waited and longed for a savior. Their spirits have sought him in the night, and I am so encouraged by their hope. I am so encouraged by their trust in God. Their spirits have sought him diligently. They yearn for him, they long for him. So at the beginning of the year, right now, I think it's a good time for us to ask ourselves, do we persistently and carefully seek the Lord? Do we really desire him in our lives? Do we really long for him? And I think we can learn a lesson from the remnant. They could have been indignant. They could have been, with everything that they have gone through, they are devastated. They could have been like, you know what, forget this. God's taken everything from us. He doesn't even care about us anymore. But instead, listen to verse 9 again. It says, when the earth experiences your judgments, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Um, I, I watched a dear friend of mine. I watched her life just unravel. And she was ravished in every way. And I remember after one night I was visiting her 
and I got home and I just sat in my car and it just seems like forever and I was just distraught and I thought, wow, Lord, sometimes you really do, you take it all, you take everything from us and I was so mad and I couldn't understand why this was happening and if I'm honest, I still don't know. I still don't know why he's, he's allowed certain things to happen but what I do know is that the Lord does use these trials. He uses this pain to teach us righteousness and to teach us to rely on him. These trials, they refine us, and ultimately they make us more like him. And when we're faced with impossible decisions and situations, it's easy to be like, why are you letting this happen to me? Why is this happening to my friend? Why is this happening in my family? Um, our only recourse is to take our eyes off of the problem and place them on Christ. And I have to remind myself to do this. And I encourage you to do the same. Remember how he loves. Remember how he cares about you. Remember what you know about him. Remember his promises that he's never going to leave you or forsake you, that he never fails you. That so as, his, as the heavens are high above the earth, so are his ways higher than your ways. He's not just our savior. He is our Lord and he's sovereign. Sisters, we can either choose to respond to the Lord with awe and trust and obedience, or we can be lost to bitterness, and we can be lost to resentment, and we can become distanced from God. And those who trust the Lord understand that his hand of judgment is not just him being unkind. These faithful few, they will know that the punishment that they faced was meant to teach them righteousness. The nature of God has not changed Sometimes he makes us go through uncomfortable things. Sometimes he chastises us to get our attention, to correct us, to get us back on track. In Matthew 4, verse 17, Jesus began his earthly ministry saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 says, therefore repent and return so that your sins will be wiped away and that refreshing will come in the time in the presence of the Lord. When we truly walk with the Lord, our souls long for him. We long to be in right standing with him. Whereas the wicked will not get it until it's too late. In verse 10 of the Amplified Bible, it says, though the wicked is shown compassion and favor, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he deals unjustly and refuses to see the majesty of the Lord. The bottom line is, ultimately Israel will be completely restored but her enemies will be completely destroyed. But until then, the Israel that exists while Isaiah is giving this prophecy is a war-torn place. They are devastated. The Assyrians have made it impossible to navigate through the city. Um, they are mourning their lost ones due to loss of, through battle, through starvation, and just the general devastation. And at the end of chapter 26, in verse 20, the prophet encourages Israel, saying, Come, my people, enter into your rooms, close your doors behind you, hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. And I think that's powerful counsel for us, too. When we've made a mess of our lives, you know, we usually go into overdrive trying to fix it. And instead of running ourselves ragged and trying to just control everything in our lives to make it work the way we want it, instead of trying to manipulate the people around us to get them to do what we want, instead of withholding our love, withholding our kindness unless we get our way. Maybe we should go into hiding with the Lord behind closed doors into our secret place with him and pray and cry out to him, read his word. He wants us to depend on him. He wants us to trust in him and not ourselves and not our own abilities. And it's so ironic how we can know all this about God. We know that he is almighty. We know that he loves us. We know that he knows everything about us and everything we're going through. And yet, we still struggle with allowing him to have the final say in our lives. But ladies, the more we take in his word, the more we diligently seek him, it's going to be easier for us to surrender and allow him to be on the throne of our hearts. And my third point is remove the high places. In chapter 27, the phrase, in that day, is repeated in verses 1, 2, 12, and 13. And in these verses, God promises to punish the Leviathan, which represents a terrible beast that overwhelms man but is no match for God. Um, we've read about how God is going to judge Israel for their disobedience and idolatry. But in that day, God promises to keep his people, Israel, and nurture them in every way and guard them day and night. 
in that day, he promises to gather his people back together and give them the land that he promised for them. And in that day, the remnant will choose to worship him. But what will be the evidence of their atonement? Well, in verse 9 of chapter 27, it says, there's only way, there's only one way that Israel's sin and guilt can be completely forgot, forgiven. They must crush the stones of every pagan altar and place of worship. So we probably don't have shrines and altars set up to other gods in our homes. That's good. Don't do that. But how many of us have gods that we kind of have set up in our lives that usurp our connection with God? Do we allow our jobs and our careers to keep us so busy, busy, busy and burnt out that there is no time for the Lord? I can't do my devotions, girl. I got to get out of bed. I don't got time for this. Do we idolize and just love our children and family members so much that there is no room for God? Are there habits and tendencies that we have become enslaved to? So if you aren't sure you have anything like this in your life, just ask yourself this question. As far as the choices that you make, what do I choose over obeying God? What do I prioritize over knowing him more? Who do I place in a position of importance over Christ? Whatever you pictured in your mind, that's probably your high place. And for me, my high place notoriously has been me. Those things create tension between us and God. We have to completely destroy or pulverize these areas of our lives that we have exalted over God. Crush it to dust. But how do we do this? We have to repent. We have to change the direction that we're going in. Seeking him in the word, being obedient to him. And it's not a one and done. We choose to walk with the Lord or we choose to do things apart from Christ, but we do choose daily. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 says, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So if you feel really powerless and, and you know, this thing that you've allowed a stronghold in your life, you have to ask the Holy Spirit for freedom. You have to ask the Holy Spirit for deliverance. Ask every day until you are free, and he will help you. Remember, the word of God is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. And the last recorded thing that Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, he tells them that they are not alone. He says that he is with them always, even until the end of the age. Dear sisters, if the Holy Spirit is in you, he is with you always, even until the end of the age, and he doesn't want you to be in bondage to anything. And my last point is pay attention. Chapter 23, oh, I'm sorry, chapter 33, um, verses 1 and 2 begin by saying, Grief, sorrow, and misery will be upon Assyria. As soon as they have punished Israel, they themselves will be punished. Um, and this is a glimpse into future Israel when they're no longer stubborn, they're no longer self-reliant, they have accepted that God can be their only salvation during times of distress. And they are praying and longing for God and, and giving and, and just praising him for his grace. The New English translation of chapter 30, 33 verse 6 says, he is your constant source of stability and he is the stability of your times. He abundantly provides safety and great wisdom. He gives all this to those who fear him. And because God never changes, and he is completely faithful, and he keeps all of his promises. Verse 6 isn't just for the remnant. This is a promise to you. This is a promise to me. The promise of wisdom, the promise of safety, stability. It's for anyone who trusts and obeys in him and fears him. Um, and just to be clear, fearing the Lord is not how we fear spiders and, and walking down like dark alleys. But the fear of the Lord means to have a deep reverence for him. The fear of the Lord causes us to obey him and to worship him and to respect the authority of God in our lives. But again, Isaiah is describing a future prophecy for Israel. They're not out of the woods yet. They get kind of snapped back to reality in verses 7 and 9. The brave men who thought that they could go to other nations and have alliances with them, they're not so brave anymore. They are openly crying and weeping in the streets. The highways are desolate. The covenant has been broken. 
and the land languishes and mourns. No other nation or ally will be able to redeem or rescue them, and ultimately, only when Christ returns for a second time will Jerusalem be free of all war and oppression and dysfunction and the terror of physical and spiritual darkness. Chapter 24 describes how God is going to annihilate all nations that have come against his chosen people. In verse 5, it says, My sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom and upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. Um, Edom is named specifically here, but Edom represents hostile nations that have, have opposed him, all hostile nations. So it's not just Edom that will have wrath laid upon them. It will be any nation. It will be any people that have come against Israel. So listen to how graphic this is in the New English translation. Again, it says in verse 3 and 4, their slain will be left unburied. Their corpses will stink. The hills will soak up the blood. And down to verse 6, it says, the Lord's sword is dripping with blood. It is covered with fat. It drips with the blood of young rams and goats, and it is covered with the fat of rams kidneys. For the Lord is holding a sacrifice in Basra, a slaughter in the land of Edom. In chapter 34, it goes on, and the Lord likens this day of wrath to a great sacrifice where all of his enemies, as well as wicked Israelites, will be slaughtered and the land will be reduced to waste where only unclean things will live there. But the first thing Isaiah does at the beginning of chapter 34 is urge the nations to draw near as he's telling this prophecy Hear and listen to the judgment that the Lord has against you. Which begs the question, are we paying attention? Um, I was so moved by Mary's message at our Christmas brunch last month. It seems like forever ago, but it was just last month. Um, and she asked, what has the Lord promised to you? So just as the Lord has promised wrath on these rebellious nations, he's made promises to us. Are we paying attention to him as he reveals these promises to us? Or are we preoccupied? Are we hearing and listening to the words that he's saying to us? Or have we been seduced by shiny, frivolous distractions? And as I end here, um, I just want to point out that we cannot keep up the facade that, oh, everything's OK, and we're living perfectly godly lives when behind closed doors we know we're not. We cannot pretend to know that, we can't pretend to not know that our family and friends are unsaved. We cannot close our eyes to the deterioration of our Christian values in our homes, in our schools, in our church, in our government. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he is coming back. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, he said he's coming back quickly. What, that could be the end of this year. That could be tomorrow. But because we don't know when he's coming back, let us be ready. We have to pay attention to what is happening around us. Um, in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, he writes a letter to the Corinthian church, whose greatest problem is worldliness. You know, living here in L.A., I'm sure we can imagine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, he lays out five commands for the church there. It says, to be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, Act like men, be strong, and let all that you do be done in love. Both the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament apostle, they offer a warning. Pay attention. Be alert. The Lord is coming back to rescue the faithful and to destroy the wicked. But in the meantime, let's encourage one another to be alert, to be strong, to stand firm, act like women, and do all things in love. Let's pray. Lord, we just love you so much. Lord, we just give this night to you. Lord, may these words be ringing in our ears, Lord. And I pray that your word would be dwelling richly within all of us, Lord. I pray for my sisters here this evening. Lord, you know where they are at the beginning of the year. You know what they've left behind. Lord, you know what they face tomorrow. But Father, wherever they are, Lord, I pray that you would be with them. I pray that they would draw near to you and that you would draw near to them. Lord, I pray and ask that you would rebuke the enemy, Lord, as he comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And Father, may you be glorified in their lives, whatever they do, Lord. May it all be for your glory and all, all for you to be happy and pleased with us, Father. And Lord, we thank you. 
thank you for how you have brought us into a new year, God. I ask that you go before us and come behind us, Lord, and may your hand be upon us. I pray and I ask all these blessings in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen.
for your faithfulness, God. We love you. God bless you, ladies. Enjoy small groups.